Welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who took the road less traveled and still has the rash to prove it. Mr. Lord Baumgarten, Lauren! <laughs> I'm sorry. Usually I come in with a big like, hey, Brett Adams, but I can't. I'm sorry. I got caught up in the rash. Caught, caught up in the rash might just be the title of the episode. Uh, that's great. <laughs> right, out, right out of the gate. Oh, uh, and I'm God. so glad you chose that as a reference, Brent, because I'm excited to talk about it. But, but first, how the hell are you? I'm doing great, man. I am doing just great. It's been a, it's been a fun week. It's been a productive week as far as gaming is concerned. Other productivity tasks might have suffered as a result, but that doesn't matter because Gwent was played. Not Witcher ah. 3, but Gwent. And and it was good. It was very, very good, as we'll talk about. You're, you're addicted now, aren't you? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, it, I, it can makes stop, you, I can stop any time, but I can't. It makes you, it does, it begs the question, does it not? Like, how is this not a mobile game? I'll talk more about it, but like I've actually gone from I've actually gone from that from how is this not a mobile game? Oh, they're leaving so much money on the table to now I'm actually pissed about it. Yeah, no, I could care less how much money they leave on the table. Just to be clear, yeah, I, like I sit around and think about the fact that Gwent does not exist as its own application on mobile devices and so forth, and I get angry. And this and this is absolutely true. I have dreamed twice in the last week of playing Gwent on my iPad and woken up and just, Oh, it was a dream. Damn it. Yeah. Like, yes. I mean, that is how like it's infecting my subconscious, but, uh, I, I know, man, that's exactly, that's exactly it. Like, again, I mean, I could, again, care less how much money they leave on the table, but it is, it, it is such a good game and it's so perfect for the mobile platform. So let's go ahead and kick things off. Of course, uh, we want to lead with some corrections, some corrections that, we need to address right here at the top of the show. Uh, one of which is about Gwent, so that actually ends up being a pretty good segue. Of course, we were lamenting the fact that that there there wasn't a, a mobile version of Gwent, but also we were talking about how great it would be as a physical card game. And of course, some people have made their own Gwent decks using textures from the game. But as Aussie Legend reminded me, and, and I had read this and totally forgotten about it, but there was a physical Gwent deck included in, uh, in, in an Xbox One bundle. So there is a, an official CD Projekt Red Witcher 3 Gwent deck floating around out there if you picked up one of those bundles. And I'd like to have one. The, the video game store, the local place I go to, G2K, they have a game room. They do tabletop nights. They do board game nights. Uh, you know, people play Magic, people play Pokemon, and if Gwent was a thing, like if more people than bought that Xbox One bundle had physical Gwent decks, bet your ass I'd be down there playing. Oh yeah, absolutely. I I just I was looking it up online as you were talking, Brent, and they're gorgeous. The cards are gorgeous. I don't yeah. know why this isn't just for sale. It, it, and in theory, in theory, I, I guess it will be. I mean, I, I get that. Uh, I get the exclusivity surrounding the bundle and everything. But, oh, absolutely. You know, but I mean, like, that's like pre-order DLC and stuff like that. Eventually, that shit usually filters down to the point where everybody can get a hold of it. So anyway. Uh, Correction number up, two. Item number two. As some people pointed out, there were some problems with the audio in Outlaw Gamer Radio episode number 29. We had a little bit of uh, difficulty that week. And I just wanted to let everybody know that I, I went back to that file. I revisited that. And I was able to tweak things and get it all kind of smoothed out, so that sort of pumping sound effect that that you heard is gone now, and that audio is uploaded. So anyway, episode twenty nine should be fixed. For those of you who were not too keen on the problems we had in that episode, thank you. Brent. And also, I just would like to point out that during that episode, because I was re-listening to it as I was editing, and during that episode. I discovered that I used the word antagonist incorrectly four times where I meant to say protagonist, protagonist. And, uh, and basically I, I drove myself near to the point of madness and suicide. <laughs> listening to it. Listening to my stupidity. So anyway, I appreciate you know, but no one embarrassed me about it on Twitter. 
because God knows I'm good enough at embarrassing myself. I don't need the help. But anyway, so there's that. Uh, speaking of embarrassing myself, last week I stated on the show that uh, it'd be great if Yafit Koto were still alive to be in Mafia 3. Turns out Yafit Koto is still alive. <laughs> In my defense, I got him confused. He looked dead when I saw him last time. In my defense, I got him confused with Christopher Lee. <laughs> and I don't I really I don't I don't think that's a great defense, Brian. Okay, no, that's, that's the thing. Now, now you you doubt me, but hear me out on this, okay? Yafa Koto, Christopher Lee, both sex symbols in the late sixties, early seventies, both known for starring in genre defining horror films, both played Bond villains during Roger Moore's tenure. I'm telling you, they have a lot more in common. They're than almost they have identical different. twins. They're if, almost identical if twins. If they were standing next to each other, I would defy you to, to tell them <laughs> apart. All right? <laughs> that is awesome. I'm glad you called that out, Brent, because the last time, you know, Yafit listens to this show, mm. and the last time that he sent us an email, uh, uh, you know, he was, he, 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 was, he was a friend of the show, and now I'm afraid yeah. we might never hear from him again. And like every time we email him back, like he turns on like this massive steam trap and just lets it run while we're trying to talk to him. And, and then like once we, once we go around the corner, he turns it off, you know, it's just, it's weird. But anyway, <laughs> apologies uh, to right. Yafikoto. So now that we've done 20 minutes of Brent, uh, <laughs> apologizing. All right. So let's move on. All right. Into let's the do Brent, show. because there is some stuff I want to talk about. And the first one is 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 really not one of them. I, just I was going to say because like I could really give a shit about Rainbow Six Siege <laughs> getting delayed six weeks, but, but I feel like has. we owe you. Yes, it was it, it was due mid October, and now it's coming out on December first. And the reason is because they have to make the game better, and the beta is still that's still set to start on time, which is late September. It's like September twenty something or other fourth or something like that i'll find out while we're talking about it but anyway yeah but the game itself the release date has been delayed to december 1st but i mean who uh, gives a shit i'm the only person that actually is interested in this motherfucking game i so am curious uh, yeah yeah I don't, I don't know september 24th the, the closed beta will still begin on september 24th and i did i did get a closed beta key on the pc brent i don't know did you get one no i didn't get one did, are they aware of the fact that you've actively bagged on the game and i have actively tried to, to, to be optimistic and supportive of the game, and they sent you the beta key? I don't think when I clicked the link on some random website that said click here for beta key, I don't think they really cared who I was. But, but they, uh, got, I mean, they got your Google... Man, the, the NSA knows, man. The NSA knows you don't like this game. Come on. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I'm, I'm the guy you want You want to play this because you, I, you want to convince me that it's good, right? Well, obviously, they don't want to convince me, because now I think it sucks. That's right. If it so, was a good so, uh, game, it wouldn't have gotten delayed. Am I right, or what? That, oh, God. Uh, yeah, so we'll see when, it, when, when the uh, closed beta um, opens up in, in September. But uh, All yeah, I'm saying anyway, is it's delayed. Fantastic don't care. Four of video games. That's all I'm saying. Uh, next up, Brent, we have Fallout Shelter. Yeah, which uh, we'll talk a little bit about in the What We're Playing section, as I have been playing Fallout Shelter. But it turns out I'm not the only one, unlike the Rainbow Six Siege thing. Turns out they've topped one billion play sessions in the first month alone. That's a billion play sessions. And that's before the game came out on Android. That was just the iOS. That was just the iOS crowd at the time. But there's some remarkable stats about how many people have played this game and all you know, like how many babies were born in the vault and how many how many hours dwellers spent exploring the wasteland and there's a cool infographic that shows all that stuff off, but it, it's pretty remarkable. I, I mean, a, as I said back when we were uh, covering E3, and I thought that Bethesda just knocked it out of the park with their press conference, and perhaps the piece de resistance was the announcement of Fallout Shelter and the, oh, by the way, as soon as this is over, you can go buy it. It's worked out pretty well for them. I, I mean, that as a marketing strategy is good, but the quality of the game backing it up, it's worked out pretty well for him, I think. Although, to be fair, I have to say as a marketing strategy, mm. m you know, maybe not so great when you segment the market and only half your players can actually do what you just said. However... And yet they had a billion play sessions, Lauren, so it's hard to imagine that anybody could consider that a mistake unless you've taken a job at Square Enix and haven't told me. 
No, no. I mean, obviously, if, if what you're looking for in your audience is a bunch of sheeple that follow the Mac, or no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, no, no. This is great news. It's a fantastic game. And obviously, when you know, if you put out even a moderate quality game for free from a big developer like this, I would imagine that you would get a you know a certain number of play sessions just because of who you are. But obviously, Fallout Shelter is a fantastic game, and uh, it has obviously done very, very well for them. And frankly. Maybe should be a little tip of the hat to the folks over at CD Projekt Red to put out some fucking Gwent. I agree. Uh, they they could take a page out of the Bethesda playbook. Uh, just a thought. Okay. Next up, Brent. I'm very excited about this. So it, we record the show on Monday nights, as everybody knows, and today happens to be the day before Until Dawn comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it comes out tomorrow. I'm very excited about this game. Uh, and the reviews just came out today, and they're... Uh, very, very positive. A lot of uh, kind of all over the map, as I expected uh, from uh, from this game, which is kind of akin to a Heavy Rain in terms of play style, and also has the uh, added distinction of being a sort of camp uh, horror, B horror movie, teen horror genre type of uh, game, which is uh, unlike um, m- most things out there and very specific taste wise, and so. The reviews are all over the place, from 60s to 90s, up to 90. I think Jim Jim Sterling gave it a 95. Right. Um, very, very excited about this game. But I didn't know any of that, Brent, when I put this trailer on the docket. And I put this trailer on here because whether or not you're excited for the game, I just think this is a, a really fine piece of media. I think it's a great trailer. Uh, so I wanted to share it with people. I thought you guys should check it out. It's, it's Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken, uh, played over uh, a live-action film that's supposed to give you the sense of playing the game. And I thought it was really well done. I love the poem. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Robert Frost. And I thought that part of the trailer was excellent. And sort of objectively, like kind of taking my emotional reaction out of it, you look at the trailer and it's just a, a nice little short piece of, you know, some of the horror genre's greatest hits in terms of the suspense and the scares and some of, you know, some of the reveals and just playing with light and shadow, woman running through the woods, maniac killer on her tail. You know, it's, it's just, like I said, it's just, you know, sort of like a, a tiny little greatest hits collection of, of certain beats from... Tropes, that, right, yeah. Yeah, that, that genre of, of a horror film. Um, once I put my emotions back into it, I am reminded of everything that I hate and despise about that genre of film. Because <laughs> the, the, the whole point of the trailer is, uh. is choices. The whole point of the trailer is is that you have options available to you. You have choices you can make, and here's what happens. We see what happens to to the protagonist in this trailer, and then it comes back to that moment of decision, and then you know she makes another choice, and of course that ends with her dead too, and then it comes back to that moment of decision. So finally, after two strikes, she does not make a run for it out of the woods, but instead goes, goes over and uh, pulls an axe out of a log, uh, and and then she she goes back into the house, and I'm sitting there like like thinking to myself, if arming yourself in the face of near certain death is your last choice, you don't fucking deserve to live. And this <laughs> is my problem with that genre. It is it assumes that every character in one of these fucking films has an IQ of four, and it drives me fucking insane. <laughs> I fucking hate. I hate horror movies for this reason. So, so, uh, here, so I, I would proffer to you, Brent, that this trailer did a fantastic job of what it's doing because that is exactly, uh, you know, it, 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 the whole game and a lot of reviews are talking about this in an endearing way is meant to be to play on those classic horror movie tropes and yeah. be an homage to those, you know, I know what you did last summer and Cabin mm-hmm. in the Woods and those kind of movies. And so, if if it evokes from you the same fierce emotion that uh that these types of movies do that i would say that it's doing its job it just happens to be not for you yeah uh i i definitely think as much as i as much as i love the idea of what this game is doing with its story i have to say i think i'm probably going to resign myself to let's plays because if this if this trailer is in the indication this is going to be an exercise of frustration for me trying to play it's it's like you know like which is the button on the controller to make the i'm not a stupid fuck decision like whichever <laughs> that button is just press that one anyway. uh but i do think it's a really well done trailer and i think you should check it out actually so- you know what no hold on before we move on maybe i need to play this maybe i need to play this because perhaps perhaps 
you know, this game will allow me make those choices take that my, you never get to make. Exactly, exactly. Take this criticism and put it to the test and see. That's interesting, Brent. And actually put it into action and say, uh, you dumb assholes would run right. when, in fact, what you should do is turn around and go back or go over there. And you could actually do that and see what happens. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Maybe so anyway. you should. All right. Yeah, we're going to talk about it more next week, obviously. I'm going to play it this week. Um, next up in the garage, Brent, we have an article from Digital Foundry, which I think is. Uh, very, very interesting. And it's an article about the new Nathan Drake collection, the Uncharted Nathan Drake collection. Yep. And uh, the title is Uncharted the Nathan Drake Collection is more than just a remaster. Uh, and Digital Foundry went through and did its Digital Foundry thing, looking at the most recent trailer for the Nathan Drake, Nathan Drake collection, uh, and did some side-by-side comparisons of the PS3 and PS4 version, and essentially uh, are giving it the big Digital Foundry thumbs up in terms of saying that the um, the re the remastering is actually they think more than remaster. It's it's they're actually redoing some stuff in the game, and uh, I that is very exciting to me, Brent. Yeah, I thought that there were a number of things pointed out in this article that were were really interesting and noteworthy. Now, admittedly, they haven't got their hands on the final game or anything like that. They're just comparing the media that they've been able to get their hands on thus far. But everything that they've seen has they talk about being very optimistic about. One of the things that they mentioned that really stood out to me because it it's kind of a pet peeve of mine is the lack of motion blur that they see. Motion blur was introduced in Uncharted 2 and they talk about see, they're seeing a lack of motion blur right now and they're they're hoping that that's something that is going to make it into the final version of the game because it's such an important part of what makes Uncharted look like Uncharted. And there's there's a throwaway line in there where they said people often forget how important motion blur is even at 60 frame a second. And I completely agree with that. And it's, it's one of those things that it, it bugs me when it bugs me when I see things like films and things like that that are shot at 24 frame a second. And the reason they're shot at 24 frame a second these days, yeah, like at one time it was just a necessity, but these days you, you have all these options. And the reason you shoot at 24 frames a second is that it has a distinct look. It has like this film look. And the reason it has that film look is because of motion blur. And when you take out the motion blur, it makes your $150 million movie look like it was shot on beta cam from your local news station. And I, I find that it really kind of ruins the aesthetic of what makes film film. And so I thought that was a really, really important observation and that's something that people need to think about. Just because it's a 60 frame a second doesn't mean you have to take out the motion blur too. I get that you want the, the ultra smooth, uh, you want the ultra smooth feel and, and the real velvety stuff, but you can strike a balance and have that that motion blur, which gives things that heavy kinetic feel and that more sort of filmic cinematic kind of thing that Uncharted likes to do. Uh, you you can strike a balance between those two things. I think. Yeah, it's like watching something on. You know, a, a lot of times I see people buy 240 hertz TVs. Yeah. Thinking the bigger the number, the better the the experience. And a lot of times those 240 hertz TVs are so overly clear that uh, that it's exactly what you say. It looks like it's shot on a Betamax. Yep. So anyway, uh, but that was just uh, that was just one interesting little little. Yeah, and, and they did. You know, they did say obviously the game is not you know quite out yet. And I think was it Uncharted Two, Brent, or Uncharted Three, where Motion blur actually had to be patched in. Uh, I don't remember. I'd have to. I'd have to go back and read the article. But it was. It was one of those games. The 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 motion blur had to actually be patched in. It wasn't in the initial game. So we're still waiting to see the juries out on whether or not there will be motion blur. All right. Um, and you know, Digital Foundry is a very well respected um, graphics uh, analysis of games, and so that they might even be able to impact that. To be honest with you. Uh, this is true. Although you know, credit where credits due, they they, they give a lot of lip service to Blue Point Games, who is handling Indeed. the report. And Blue, Blue Point is kind of the studio down there in Austin, Texas, that does this kind of thing and does it well. They've got a really good track record as far as doing these remasters, things like the God of War collection, the Eco and Shadow of Colossus uh, collection for PlayStation 3, the Metal Gear Solid HD stuff. Uh, so they're, they're in pretty... I would say that uh, the Uncharted games are in pretty good hands with uh, the team down there at Blue Point. That's certainly the impression we're getting. So, all right, Brent, last up in the garage. You know, some, some things we put on here because they're news items and we want people to know. Some things we put on here because um, we think they're good pieces of media. 
Uh, others are a little bit of discussion. And then some things I put on here just because I want to know what you think of them, Brent. Yes. And this trailer falls into the latter category. Uh, or not trailer, actually. It's a video of IGN playing yes, the new fun. Mad Max game. Yeah. Uh, and they, they titled that Mad Max's fist fights can get brutally intense. Yes, they can. And uh, I, I want to elicit, Brent, your opinion on this video here, and then I'll talk about mine. Well, listen, um, I would define any, any video game fist fight that involves a protagonist who has a pair of heavy welder's gloves that they have infused with nuts, bolts, and screws in order to make a set of brass knuckle gauntlet things. I think we can go ahead and call that game a 95 on Metacritic. I mean, I think like <laughs> right there, you've won. Like you won video games. Uh, but in all seriousness, the thing that occurred to me watching this is how the fight system, and this is the first time I've really seen actual gameplay footage as opposed to something from you know a trailer or whatever, but actual gameplay footage of the fight scene. And it hadn't occurred to me that they were going to be doing like a variation on the uh, the Arkham series fight system. Uh-huh. And I like that a lot. And I like actually how different it feels in that it's really not, it's not about fighting 30 people and having like this smooth combo where you just, you know, going through the crowd and just deftly taking all of them out. It really is about brutality and building up, you know, this, this I, I, I think they call it a rage meter. I can't remember or fury, maybe like your fury meter or whatever, but they talk about maintaining that and how that can, uh, you know, actually give you, you know, bonus damage more, and that kind of right, thing. Right. More brutal finishers and, uh, different finishers. And, yeah. and, and frankly, I, I really dug it. Like, I like the sound of all of that. I, I like, I like the simplicity or I like the, the sort of seeming simplicity of the, of the Arkham fight system when that's well executed. It's as, it's as good as anything gets. And, and it, it, but it really, because it just really boils down to like those two principles of, of attack and defend, attack and defend, you know, parry, repulse, parry, repulse. And, uh, and it works really well. And I, I think it's going to work really well here. I love the idea of that being applied here into these really brutal fights with, you know, these variations like on WWE wrestling moves and things like that, clotheslines and power bombs and, all that I don't know. I I I think it's a great fit for the game. So I was pretty I was pretty excited to hear that. Did the when you were, did the video move the needle for you at all? Well, I mean, I was interested in the game already. So I I I don't know. I don't know that this is necessarily. It's not like I was on the fence and this has brought me back into the herd. I was already pretty down with the game. So this didn't really move the needle for me that much. But the needle didn't have a lot of room to move. So. Is this a day one buy for you? No, I mean I'm definitely gonna I'm definitely gonna want to wait and read some reviews and see how people are responding to it. Mm-hmm. But assuming that those things are all positive, then it's probably like a week one buy for me. Even in the face of Metal Gear Solid Five. Well, there is that. Uh, when what's what's week? the re- what's the release window between those? Are they um, the same I week? Think, I think they might they might mm. come out. Let's see, September first is Metal Gear Solid Five. Mm. And I think Mad Max is the same thing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that do, that does pose an interesting problem. Yep, September 1st, both of them, All the right. two of them. Yeah. Well, I would say that honestly, the thing to do is probably to play Mad Max first, because that's going to because take, you'll get through it more quickly. I'll, I'll get through it faster. Yeah. Right, as opposed to Metal Gear Solid, which could take you the better part of your lifetime. Yeah, this is true. This is very true. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I still want to play Mad Max. I, I mean, I want to play both of them, and obviously, you know, you gotta you gotta split the time somewhere, but. Yeah, I, I think Mad Max looks pretty fun. Yeah, I do too, actually. So this one, this one uh, did keep the needle moving forward for me. I, you know, I wasn't really turned on by a lot of the early media here. And yeah. last time we talked about Mad Max, it's that sort of changed for me. And now uh, watching this, uh, watching them play the fights, I, I also was surprised to see that Arkham esque fight and really enjoyed how brutal the the finishers were. And so now I'm really, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, reviews of this game and to seeing more in depth because it looks like it's really got potential to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I've I've kind of felt like it always had that, and if if it has like you know like the Arkham style fight system, if it's got that kind of just cause go anywhere and cause havoc kind of quality, we're we're not eating the final dish. Like we're looking at the recipe, you know. But the ingredient list has me rubbing myself under the table. So, <laughs> and that, my friends, would be why Brent and I don't go to dinner together. So I'm ready to eat.
All right, we are back in the clubhouse, and before we get to our topic this week, Brent, we had a poll relating to the potential gaming experience of Until Dawn. We did. We said, how do you feel about the potential gaming experience of Until Dawn? And here's how you voted. In fourth place with 11%, you said, I think it's massive hype for a quote-unquote game that will hardly offer anything to play. Third place with 26% of the vote went to, I'm very excited by what they're proposing to do. Second place and 29% of you said, on the fence, going to want to read some reviews and watch some let plays. But the number one answer with 34% was, I'm really not all that interested one way or the other. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, no, not fair enough. You sons of bitches have <laughs> let me down two weeks in a row. First, you didn't vote for Yarny, and now you don't care about Until Dawn? I mean, seriously, people. What's going on we- here? Weezer wrote a song about this, Lauren. They, they really did. So anyway, um, the title of the episode is Now the World Has Turned and Left Me Here. <laughs> um, uh, but let's go ahead and move on to the topic of discussion this week. It's something yes. you've been wanting to talk about for a couple of weeks now. And we just yeah, I, just, I think it's to. interesting. There's actually, we have a few topics to talk about over the next couple of weeks to choose from. But I thought this was interesting. It was a, one of the, it was a video that one of our listeners posted yep. uh, from Extra Credits, which is a source that I love. It's a little eight-minute video. Oh, yeah. I suggest you watch they it. Do great stuff. Titled, Returning to World War II, Four New Approaches. To war games, and essentially, uh, the conversation that they're trying to spark, and the one that we're going to have a little bit, is if the industry is ready to return to World War II, and if there's ways that we could return to this um, <laughs> much overused genre uh, and do it in, effectively and in a way that makes it interesting. The answers are maybe and yes. Uh, I agree, Brent, a hundred percent. And frankly, uh, Return of uh, Castle Wolfenstein is a not Return to Wolfenstein, but Wolfenstein: The New Order um, is a fantastic um, example of that. However, which they do mention, uh, they, they mention that uh, that Wolfenstein does well, well. One thing in particular that, that Wolfenstein does right, which is really, really exploring sort of the uh, the, the depravity of uh, of Nazi philosophy. Indeed. So let's so let's back up for a sec, Brent. We'll talk about one of the first things they talk about, and which I think is uh, one of the most notable and, and I think uh, most powerful things we could do to make World War II some, somewhat more interesting again as a game um, milieu, and that is uh, steer, steering away from the traditional sort of areas of the war that that games tend to focus on, Euro- which is to like- say the European theater. Which is to say the European theater, uh, Stalingrad, you know, Russia, that sort of thing. And, and uh, what they talk about is there are so many more um, sort of a- uh, geographic areas around the world that involve World War II that simply don't get explored. And they, uh, they refer to uh, Mongolia, China. They refer to, was it uh, Libya, Brent, I believe, or was it uh, yeah. Liberia? Well, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Middle East during World War II. There's South Africa. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, I think you know people people know about North Africa and Monty and and Patton and and you know obviously the tank warfare that was going on there. That was where Christopher Lee was uh, was active. By the way, he was active in uh, in the North African theater for a time. But anyway, there there are. I, I mean, the, the the thing that is said in this video, and I think that sometimes, I think that sometimes people, uh, or you know, at least people who who have not study world war ii a little bit do forget is that it was the entire world at war i think that people sometimes distill it down to the u.s the uk russia germany japan and and they kind of forget about just how much of the globe was wrapped up in world war ii and and all of these all of these uh, places many of which i still haven't learned to pronounce properly uh, the the conflict kind of boiled over into, and so I, I totally agree. I totally agree with the point they're making. There is so much, there, there there is so much material here that could be mined. And the thing that is often on my mind in these things, just because I, I do have an interest in history, is it's such an opportunity to to educate people a little bit. It's such an opportunity to to give people information that they they don't have. I mean, at this point, if you've played a lot of World War II games. You you probably do know some shit about World War II. You you probably have a semblance of what went on in the European theater and the timeline and some of the things involved. But it'd be a great opportunity to have a lot of fun and you know play some kick ass games, but also learn some new things about this conflict that defined the 20th century, which I am all about. Indeed, I I think that uh, you know one of my favorite things, Brent. I was just talking. I was playing some Rocket League with. 
a couple of the guys from the site. And I was talking to them about one of my favorite games recently was Never Alone, which I have not finished. Mm-hmm. Uh, and interspersed throughout that game in, in, in the most wonderful way are live action sort of documentary shorts yeah. that are about three minutes long. And I absolutely think they're fantastic. And I could definitely see something like that innervated into a game about World War II. But uh, even, Brent, I mean, we talked, you know, you alluded to and I talked about some of the more esoteric locations, but even Japan as an alternate location, it's the most well, obvious. it has been explored. Yeah. I mean, it's been explored before, but, but, to a very small degree. I mean, even that. Yeah, a very small has, degree has, considering like what an intense thing the Pacific Theater was. Absolutely. I mean, that was uh I have a lot of interest in that because it was uh I, I mean, it was tough like like the the island hopping thing that had to happen uh between us and Japan. I mean, that was some of the most fierce fighting of the war right there, so Yeah, indeed. So I think I think it's a brilliant suggestion. I mean, there's so much more to do location-wise that I think it's a really, really smart uh, idea. And so some other suggestions that he talks about, you couple that with, for example, uh, one of the other suggestions that he talks about, which is changing the structure of the gameplay. Uh, so it's not your sort of typical, uh, essentially, corridor first-person shooter. Yeah, totally agree. I, 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 well, I love his suggestion about doing something like Far Cry, where you know it's about, it's about explore, raid, and, and take, over, take over enemy bases enemy encampments i I mean like what a it seems like a no-brainer in hindsight like what a perfect match that style of game would be in this in this setting and 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 with that uh sort of changing the nature of how the game is structured also in terms of where location so he he alludes to you know you don't need to necessarily be uh hopping all over the world but if you if you focused and did, and it, you know, it makes me think a little bit of, of um, I was going to say Band of Brothers, of uh, Bad Company, um, mm-hmm. a- although a very different tone, but the idea of these four guys together, and you really kind of kind of get begin to get involved with the character and the story, and so he suggests if you take a location and, and center it around a specific geographic location, and maybe one battle, or, yeah. or one sort of central battle, and the little battles that ensue around it, change the structure of the game, put those two things together, you can get a lot of different terrains. And he alludes to Spec Ops The Line uh, and how they managed to stay in Dubai the entire game but make the game feel different enough, yep. sort of visually and geographically, to be interesting with different terrains and interiors and exteriors. Um, and I think, I think it's a fantastic suggestion, Brent. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's a need, although it, was, you know, it certainly is interesting uh, and it's, it's not a bad choice. Uh, it's not the only choice to... Uh, not focus in one geographic area as opposed to hopping all over the world. And I think you can really get to know an area. They're both valid, but they they both just sort of elicit like a different experience. Indeed. And I think if you... uh, I I think we've had a lot of the the former, the, you know, the, the sort of hopping all over the world. And if you were to do that, to put it in a different theater than what we're used to, and perhaps change the gameplay. So, I mean... I think you could create something interesting by doing any one of these things separately, Brad. Yeah. But if you were to com- put them together, uh, I-, I think you have you know what would essentially feel extremely fresh. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, certainly World War II genre games are part. Of, you know, to me, they're canon in the video game world. Right. Um, and and I, I would I would like to see us revisit. I don't know. What do you, I mean? Is that something you're interested in? Would you go? On that journey, does that interest you? If it's not a Call of Duty game, yeah. If if they do something a bit more interesting than than just you know like like that kind of classic Call of Duty Battlefield first person shooter, I, I would totally be in, into it. I, I love the idea, especially I love the idea of fixing the gameplay in, in in a location like basically it's a game about a battle. And as they rightly point out in the videos, you know, battles could last days, weeks in some cases. And so the idea of just surrounding the game and the drama and the action around a battle taking place in this certain location, for some reason that really, really appeals to me. I think part of it is my love for open world games. And I I love the familiarity you get in open world games where you are you're playing this game and you're traveling through West Elizabeth or Tamaria or whatever. And you, uh, you become familiar with it. You, you, you know, you, you know, the location. And I, like, I, I remember, you know, like, like playing Skyrim and like every time you come back to, uh, every time you, you, you come back to dragon's reach, 
uh, you know, every time like, you know, you'd be coming in from somewhere else, you know, because obviously, you know, that's like where you have your first player home and everything. And you end up coming back there and you see it like off in the distance at night. And, you know, the lights lit up, the fires and everything going, and it feels like coming home. And you only get that feeling when you you have the ability to kind of go and come back. And, and the idea that you could take some of those principles and put them into this game where you uh, you begin to kind of develop that familiarity with the with the environment and and it you know it becomes about you know taking that hill or you know getting out of that valley that you're in and uh, those kinds of those kinds of elements I think could really be brought to life in a profound way and I, I just I love the idea of spending the time in that location really you know knowing the terrain and slowly gaining ground uh, as the uh, as the battle ensues that that's a very very compelling gameplay idea and i could see that being combined with the far cry model that we were just talking about just just imagine as an example if it was something set in the pacific theater and the game was basically about okay we have to take this island and that's what the game is the game is about taking that island the setting is that island you have access to the entire topography of the island and it's just you know, like like the game starts with you coming off the uh, you coming off the transport boat, landing on the beach and getting to work, whatever that is. And I, I just I love the idea of kind of spending time in that place and getting a, a, a taste of what the drama and everything was like for the soldiers involved. That sounds like a fantastic game. That sounds like a game I'd want to play. I agree, Brent. And so the one other thing that he proffers, which I also think is very interesting and certainly worthy of being touched on, is sort of that, and this is back to the European theater to a degree, um, well, not, I mean, to a great degree, um, and that is that sort of, um, despite all the games we have in the European theater, that that real absence of delving deeply into the Holocaust itself, Mm -hmm. and not wanting to include the Holocaust in these types of games, and and I think that, I think that is a... um, uh, I think it's a valid point, and, and I think you know. I, obviously, we understand why you don't. They, you know, games don't get mired in walking you through concentration camps, but it does miss an opportunity to really um, delve into an emotional well that is mostly as yet untouched. Um, and and I think it's interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting to sort of proffer that as well. And I, I, you know, again, it goes back to the emotional content of these games and the connections you're making to the people in them. And I think. There's room in these games for that kind of uh, relationship between the player and the characters around them. I agree, and and I think that as, as I think that they they put it well in the uh, in the video, just that it, it it seems a bit inexplicable that you can you can make so many games about World War II and not discuss one of the most profound sort of events that that occurred during World War II, which was the mass genocide of this, uh, this race of people at the hands of, uh, of the Nazis. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, video games, it's, it's not as though there aren't video games that have tried to tackle really profound subject matter or, or, or that have, you know, tried, oh, certainly not. tried yeah. to, uh, you know, to get people thinking about some, you know, deep, el- uh, deep ethical or, or philosophic, laundry and i i think that it probably owes more to the fact that these games for for the most part have really been intended as as pretty casual entertainment that's not to say that there's not outliers that have tried to be more serious about it but i i think it just kind of owes more than anything to to the attitude people had about making these games when they were the uh the soup du jour and if we were going to take another stab at it, I, I agree. I, I would love to see, I would love to see somebody do something like that with, uh, you know, just with 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 a deft touch, a little bit of uh, a little bit of insight, and just you know, just give people a, a little bit, like like they say, like it doesn't have to. You don't necessarily have to make a game about single handedly stopping the Holocaust. Although, if you wanted to do something about, say, like the Jewish resistance inside of <laughs> Germany. There's right. all kind. I mean, there's there's great action and drama going on with you know the kind of guerrilla warfare that was taking place there. Great opportunities, but just acknowledging it because at some point ignoring it sort of becomes conspicuous. 
Indeed, it does, Brent. And, and I think I think um, they're right to point this out. So, yeah. so these are a few of the different things that they suggest. I think it's. I just think I thought it was an interesting topic. You know, we haven't talked much about World War II games as of late, um, and they are such a big part of the video games, video, especially the mo- more recent video game history. And I thought I'd just throw it out there for discussion amongst, uh, obviously, between you and I and amongst our listeners, because uh, I'm curious. Are, are you interested in more World War II content? Do you feel like you've got fatigue to the point now that even if they were to change up, say, the location or maybe the, the sort of the way, uh, the way that the game is organized? And I'm reticent to use Far Cry 3 as an example, because that leads down the road of ubification. Uh, <laughs> however... Um, uh, however, I'm, so I'm curious. I'm just curious to know if, you know, when I saw this, my immediate reaction was, was oh, that would be awesome. I, I miss having some good World War II games, yeah. and I would love to have some, particularly with deep emotional content. I'd like to see something that's uh, a little bit deeper emotionally. And so uh, I thought I'd throw it out there for discussion and just see what our listeners thought. I agree. It's, it's a great topic, and, it, and hats off. It's a great video from Extra Credits. Basically, if you wanted to, if you wanted to do this and do it right, this eight-minute video would essentially be your broad stroke how-to video. All right, guys, let's hit the road and talk about some of the games that we've been playing this week. And I will go first <laughs> to Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren. Yeah, I feel like I feel like at this point we're we're we've taken this dead horse. And I feel like we're individually beating each of our listeners with it. And I feel, I feel bad, Brent. I do. And probably, so number one, these are great games. But number two, it's probably because we're, you know, kind of in that slow time in July and yeah. August. We're heading Simple. into the very, very busy season. This, this is so the time I think of this, year when you tend to go to your back catalog and be like, mm, what haven't I played that's yet? That's right. And, and I do think so. Next week, we will absolutely be talking about Until Dawn. That is no question. Uh, and then, at, you know, next uh, uh, next Tuesday is the release of both uh mad max and metal gear solid 5 so i think you will begin to hear some new commentary on games but in the meantime we're going to give you a little bit more rocket league and fallout shelter that's right so uh for rocket league brent i I really don't have a ton to say on it other than that i'm playing it the only thing i really do want to say is i've been playing uh with uh listeners from the the show this week uh ryan and uh aberjam and brack and and different listeners and so uh, i've been having a great time playing with the outlaws uh, on um, Rocket League, and I'm loving it. That's all I got to say, really. I'm loving it. I'm loving the new car. Uh, if you guys, again, if you don't have this game, it's worth the 20 bucks. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, and I want to just say thanks to the Outlaw Gamers that are playing it. And I want to start an official team because I want to be competitive. God damn it. But we'll talk about that later. Alrighty then. All right. Um, Next up is Fallout Shelter, Brent. Yeah, Fallout Shelter. So I'm still playing Fallout Shelter. And Alrighty, so my oh. my vault. I tell you what, I'm I'm starting to reach, I'm starting to reach sort of the outer edges of what the game allows for right now. Uh, as an example, I have hit my dweller limit. I have 200 dwellers in my vault, and that's all I'm allowed to have. So I, I'm not only I was talking about kind of like the the end, like the physical bottom of the vault being in sight. I'm now a bit closer to it, but uh, I've already. I've already hit one very, very real barrier, and now my strategy has kind of gone from growth to optimization, and so now it's like, well, okay, I've got 200 dwellers, I've got weapons for all my 200 dwellers, but now I'm going to have really, really good weapons for all my 200 dwellers. No more no more handguns that do three to five damage, like bare minimum, everybody's going to have a weapon that can do five to six damage, or, you know, like that kind of stuff. Uh, like st- stats maxed out on every dweller, and and that kind of stuff. And but it's, it's just kind of interesting. I, I'm I'm really curious to see if they do another update at some point soon and basically expand the game, like allow you to build bigger vaults, maybe introduce new rooms, um, and and let you have more dwellers because at this point there's there's going to be like kind of a diminishing return sort of thing where I just, you know, how much more is there going to be to, to keep me interested in playing the game outside of just starting over, which I don't particularly want to do, but at this point the options are, you know, are going to get somewhat limited as far as staying with my, my current vault. If I want to keep playing the game, probably going to have to start a new vault. If, uh, if, if I'm really interested in doing that. And the question is, am I really interested in doing that? Well, and if you do, you'd, you, you know, to make it interesting, I think you'd likely have to, 
uh, maybe artificially impose some rules on you, like all, all, women can only be on the left side and men can only be on the right side. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, something like that. Any babies you have must be sacrificed to the roach gods. <laughs> Just some thoughts to that's, spice that's it up for good, you. That's another good title to consider. Hang on, let me write that down. <laughs> Just some thoughts for right, you to consider. So what about everybody's going to the rapture? You uh, Have you gotten back to uh, Yeah, this is going to be this is gonna be a short one too, mm. Brent. Honestly, uh, you know, I talked to, I told you I was playing with one of our listeners and he kind of told me he played a couple hours of it and kind of gave up because it felt like a walking simulator. And, and, he, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the game. But he said, you know, as compared to something like, say, Ether 1, which it, it feels atmospherically like a very similar game, he said, you know, he was anticipating you would get to be able to do puzzles and so forth and solve things the way you do in Ether 1. And he said, really, you're not. You're just walking through, opening doors, and walking into these informational light bubbles, uh, essentially. Right. And while the story itself may be interesting enough, um, that's really all of the gameplay. And so, I, you know, he had mentioned that to me. I went back into the game. I played it for like... 30 minutes or 20 minutes and i and i was like you know what if and that's all i did was just walk and i thought if i if i get to two hours of this and this is all it is i'm going to be angry with the world and so i played it for like 20 or 30 minutes and it was all literally just walking opening doors and walking and i lost interest that's the truth and i i, I i'm doubtful at this point that i will go back to it gotcha well yeah you know you roll the dice and uh, and sometimes uh, you eat the bear and sometimes the bear eats you that's exactly right. Uh, all right, Brent. So, Speaking you know, of getting eaten by of, bears. We have a list of games here, and you, you have a, uh, I asked you what you'd played this week, and, and there's a game here that I, I guess, I mean, it is a game, but it's not really, it's not really its own game, but it's a game. Yeah, I, basically this week I played Gwent. And you say, oh, well, that means you played The Witcher <laughs> 3, and it's like, no, it doesn't. No, I played Gwent. I played Gwent. I love that this is happening to you. Um... I had been neglecting Gwent. I really had. I had only played maybe three, three rounds of Gwent, and two of those, Ugh. two of those were missions where you had to play Gwent. Or actually, no, all Ugh. of them. All of them. Well, okay, no, no, two of them were like the first one was the tutorial Gwent, Gwent game that you play, and the second was the uh, you have to play the Bloody Baron at one point. The third was a side mission I did. You. Uh, you run into a dwarf outside of uh, Novigrad who talks about being robbed, and he asks you to help him out, and you track down you track down the guy who robbed him in air quotes, and the guy says, I didn't rob him at all. He lost, he lost this stuff to me in a round of cards. And you can intimidate him. You can, I think maybe you can bribe him. You can use Igni on him. Or not Igni, what am I saying? You can... You can do the fucking Jedi mind trick. Well, well, you might be able to use Igni on him. It <laughs> yeah, just would do a different. Would it would a have different a different outcome. effect. But right. uh, <laughs> yeah. it's like, give me the documents or I'll set you on fire. Uh, but you know, you can use the Jedi mind trick, or you can play Gwent for them. And this is what kind of started me down the path. I I played this guy. I did this mission. I played this guy. And I beat him the first time, and I got the documents, and I went back and gave him to the dwarf, completed the mission. And then something happened, and I can't remember what it was, but whatever it was, something happened, and I ended up going back to a previous save. I had done something, maybe I maybe I'd accidentally dropped a piece of gear that I hadn't meant to, or whatever it was. I really can't remember why I went back to that previous save, but I went back to a previous save and ended up having to redo about 45 minutes of play. And I had to do that mission over again. And whereas the first time I beat the guy handily, the very first time I played Gwent with him, this time I could not beat him to save my life. And seriously, it took me like five or six hands to to finally win again and be able to complete the mission in that way, which I really wanted to do. But playing those five or six rounds of Gwent taught me that while I understood the mechanics of the game, there was a depth of strategy that I was completely ignorant of. And I started thinking about what I should have been doing and how I should have been holding this card back and how I should have been, you know, pressing my advantage more here. It's like, you know, like, well, if I had just done this, like, you know, I had two more cards than he did. If I could have, if I would have just kept pounding away, I could have gotten him down to zero cards. And then the next round I would have won by default because he just wouldn't have had anything to play. And, you know, you yep. start thinking about like all those yes, kinds of play sir. strategies and yep. it really started to get to me. And, uh, I just said, okay, you know what? I'm going to focus on this a little bit 
and a little bit turned into a lot. So I basically backtracked through the game and sort of figured out, all right, here is where here's where you kind of pick up playing Gwent, starting with that guy in the courtyard in the in the in Vesima, in the uh in the uh, the capital. Mm-hmm. And I basically just started from that point and started moving forward and just crossed really just started moving across Velen and concentrating on Gwent. And I looked at all the places on the map I'd visited. I fast traveled to all of them. If I could play with a merchant, I, you know, and of course buying cards, you know, like visiting merchants, buying Gwent cards, if they had them playing them, if, uh, if I could beating everybody, you know, so like I'd, I'd get a card out of the deal, uh, you know, tracking down herbalists, tracking down like the traveling merchants, you know, just trying to find everybody I could, to play anybody and everybody and then after i did that i started looking at the map and saying okay where haven't i been and anything that looked remotely like civilization anything that looked remotely like it could be a town or a small little village or something like that i i would ride there i would go there and i would find out if there was a merchant or somebody there that i could play gwent with and or you know buy cards from or whatever and it, it's it's fascinating like it, it's it's absolutely fascinating how it's changed my experience of the game because i put the main story of the game on hold I'm, I'm not doing that at the moment and instead i'm i've just become like Geralt the the gwent player the, Gw- but the thing that's, <laughs> Geralt of gwent but the thing that's interesting is that riding from this town where i've got a fast travel point unlocked to the next town that i well you know to the next point in the map that i think is a town along the way you run into adventure, you run into people, you run into monsters. And so the game happens anyway, but it just, it just changes it from being like a real story driven experience to being just an, just a experience, you know, just this, this kind of like, Oh, this is my day to day life. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a hardcore Gwent player who just, you know, happens to, also be a witcher and I uh, travel from town to town <laughs> trying to <laughs> win at Gwent and along the way helping people with various monster problems or, you know, whatever. And it's fucking awesome. It's awesome. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I know I'm going on here, but I'll just, I'll briefly recap. There's that, there's that mission that you do like, like a uh, Gwent players of Velen or whatever it is, where you're supposed to play at first. It's like two people you're supposed to play and get a unique card from. And then, like, it, like after you beat the first one, like, it opens up, and they say, oh, well, you should also go play this person. So, like, there's three people on that list now. I have beat two of the three. I beat the uh, the boat builder, and then I beat the kid, Hattie. I have not beat the soothsayer, because he's playing with the monster uh, deck. And yep. they've got that fucking thing where, like, you know, you, you put, like, one card in one slot, and it, like, brings in two other cards from the pile. And... At one point, he had like a hundred and six points in his uh, in his melee in his melee row, and I didn't have Biting Frost to play to <laughs> to at least give myself a fighting chance. So that did not end well. I'm gonna have to work on that more. But uh, I, I've I've managed to unlock uh, two, or I've managed to win like you know two unique cards with like ten strength that can't be. Uh, you know that th- they can't have that value reduced by your typical atmospheric stuff, and then I also went to um, I went to Oxenfurt, you know, way out in the east there, and um, like it, like in Velen, they play Gwent, right? But like over in Oxenfurt, they play Gwent, and there's there's a subtle distinction between those two. I like I went and played like a like a maybe three people, a couple merchants and like a bartender in Oxenfurt, and I got my ass destroyed. I mean, they turned my buttocks into mashed potatoes. They destroyed me. It was not even it was not even a contest. It was them laughing at me and taking my money as they kicked my ass. And like I thought, the people in Skellige were challenging, which is why I came back to Velen because, like, well, I got to like up my game. I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to hang here, man. The people in Oxenfurt destroyed me, so I'm sticking to Velen for the time being. Although I have gone back to Novigrad, I've beaten a couple of people in Novigrad, 
So I'm going to I'm going to start working on Novigrad next cuz I am beginning to run out of places to go in Velen. F- 5 years from now, I want you to go back and listen to this and <laughs> listen to the conversation <laughs> about about going from Velen to Oxenfurt to Skellige yeah. and back to Velen to play Gwent against the barkeepers, the innkeepers, the herbalists. uh of the herbalists yeah. and the blacksmiths of the world, whether it be in Velen or Skellige. Uh, and I just love I I love I love the degree to which you are sort of bought into the universe and the world. And a lot of it, again, I've played, I'm at about 40 hours in the game. I still can only play one faction because I don't have enough cards really? to play for any, any, do you have two factions? I'm, I'm damn close. I'm damn close. So am I. I I've got, so am I, I've got 18, I'm not there I've yet. got 18 of the 22 unit cards. I need to play Nilf guardian and I've got right. 16, uh, to play uh, Skoa, I, I don't know how it's pronounced. Like you know, Skoa Teal or Skoa Teal, right? Yeah, I, I've got. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same way, man. I've got I've got 19 of 22 Skoa Teal cards, yeah. but the fact is, is I still can only play Northern Realms every time I play, and and it's, <laughs> and it's amazing. But the, but it is so. I love that you're so bought into the world, but it's also a, such a testament to the game of Gwent itself that you go play hours of it, and the game happen, and the the game, like you said, the game happens around you. Yeah. When you're doing that, and it's just brilliant. It's brilliant, and it's one of the things that I think uh, Witcher Three is better than Red Dead, and it's better than any game that I've ever played. Is that sort of mini game within the game is is just absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it, it's absolutely amazing. I, I mean, I, I can't. Th- th- there's there's things about. I don't know how the story of Witcher Three is is going to affect me. Like, I don't know if I'm going to walk away from it having the profound emotional involvement that I did in Red Dead. I don't right. feel that I do right now. But I, I don't know at this point in Red Dead if I really did. Like it, it wasn't until sort of the end of the experience that I began to kind of realize how much Red Dead meant to me. But well, also to be fair, Red Dead. So the setting of Red Dead was very powerful and unique. I agree. The western, that sort but of thing, and there's, there's the end of Red Dead had a big part yes, to do with the emotional nature of exactly, the game. That's what I'm saying. Like the end of Red Dead is really what kind of solidified that. But there are things about The Witcher Three. That well, I'll I'll just give you I'll give you a real brief anecdote here. I I had gone to the uh, like I said I'd been to Oxenfurt, and then you know if you look in the southeast of the of the map of Velen, there's this huge, uh, there's this huge like you know some sort of civilization or something in that southeast corner that takes up a lot of space and but it doesn't quite look like a town. And so I rode down there. Well, it turns out that's where the Nilfgaardian army is encamped, and. Um, yeah, there's a couple of secondary missions you can do there, and and you can play the quartermaster for Gwent, uh, which I did. And so I was kind of finished up there, and I was getting ready to, to ride off and do this other thing. And I'm just I'm sitting on top of Roach, and I have been looking at the map, kind of getting a plan of action together. I come out of the map, and just where the camera where the camera was when I when I pulled out of the map. I'm looking off into the distance. I'm looking out to the west, and I see these two. I see these two mountains, and on top of one of them is this really large square tower, and on top of the other one is is a tree the size of the moon, right? Like this gigantic, like you know, Yggdrasil, the world tree, is sitting on top of this goddamn mountain to the west of the Nilfgaard camp. And I'm sitting there looking at it. I'm like, what in the fuck is that? And so I said, you know what? I'm going to ride over there and see. And so I just start riding west, and eventually I, you know, I pick up a road that'll get me up there, and I, you know, start going up this uh, up this mountain goat path. And I realize it's taking me up towards the tower, which is the southernmost point of the of the two. And I get up there, and I'm getting close to this tower, getting close to this tower, and all of a sudden I hear this, you know, this monster cry out. And so I get off Roach and I go stalking around and I come upon a, uh, uh, I can't remember if it was a, a, a wyvern or, you know, some sort of draconid, like, like a wyvern or something like that. And, um, I, you know, so like I, you know, I go into the inventory, I get out the draconid oil, I put it on the blade, I check the bestiary, make sure that I, uh, make sure I know, you know, which signs are good for this, uh, you know, get at, you know, get the bomb that I need into my uh in, into my weapon slot and all that stuff I t- go charging in completely destroy him take him out find this great treasure cache and discover that th- I'm actually at, at a lower point in the mountain there's actually another tower at the very very top so I 
I go running up there and I run headlong into a giant and the giant's like 12 levels above me. And so I back out gracefully and run for my life. But uh, I, I end up unlocking a fast travel point up on the top of this mountain. So then like I, I you know, I go over, I go over to check out this tree and it turns out there's like a draconid breeding ground over there because there's like a cockatrice, there's like wyverns, there's uh, there's harpies, and just all manner of beasties trying to eradicate me. And so I backed off of that. I'm like, you know what? Like, I don't need this kind of trouble right now. I've got Gwent to play, you see. And so back down the mountain I went. But it was just that 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 whole joy of exploration of just seeing some point off into the distance. And gee, I wonder what's over there. And then going over there. And discovering there's something really cool there. Like there's like you can go over there and just see it if you want to, but there's actually shit to do. And so it's one of those things I'm going to go back and do when I'm a little bit higher level and feel feel like I can hang a bit more. But in, in that sense, it is a lot like Red Dead. But I will say that I think that I think while there's a lot of empty space in Red Dead, I think this world is more dense. I think that there is more to see and do in The Witcher Three, which is pretty incredible given the fact that it's bigger. Indeed, it is. It's ah, uh, it's such a good game. I'm so, so excited that you're sucked into the world, Brent. Oh man, I, I love it. I mean, honestly, you were talking about, well, William, what are you going to do? You're going to play Mad Max, or you're going to play uh, Phantom Pain? And I'm like, right, you can't let go of the fact that, like, like I, I, you know, I have. You, you talked to me about us doing maybe doing a post mortem on the and Witcher. I want to do that. And I said, I said, yeah, I would love to do that. Let's talk about time frames or whatever. And and, and I, I like immediately today. I'm thinking, okay, I get. I'm getting until dawn tomorrow, which I'm dying to play. Yeah. Um, a week later, Metal Gear Solid Five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a week later, Metal Gear Solid and uh, Metal Gear Solid Five comes out, which I, I, I'm I'm dying to play, and that game could take me easily a month. Like we're yeah. about to get to that time, and and I've got The Witcher, which has got to have thirty plus more hours left in it for me at least. You know, well, dude, that's the thing. I mean, I've got I've got a half. Uh, I've got to be closing in on fifty hours. I've, yeah, I mean, it's, I've got to be closing in on fifty hours of The Witcher Three at this point, and I, I like, I, I can't even imagine I'm halfway through the story. <laughs> I know, I know, such a uh, great, such a great I, game. I, I, All yeah, right. it's so. Yeah, I know. I, we could just keep going Mad on, Max on. But Brent, I would Pain. like to. Gonna, I got to finish The Witcher first. Jesus. I would, and I, th- I have a feeling we're going to be this way about Phantom Pain also. Yeah, but I, I, I kind of uh, think so, which is why I want to finish the witcher 3 before i move to it because i suspect no i know uh so brent i want to let's head out into the sunset yeah. uh and talk about another game that i want to talk which i've already talked yeah. about actually but my end of the sunset this week is a little more rocket league but it's a video i wanted to post for you guys it's the the mlg major league gaming uh grand finals their first uh rocket league comp- competition i don't ever 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 watch esports but uh, I watched this, and I, I think Rocket League is particularly good for esports because of the nature of the quick matches and how much fun it is to watch, even if you don't play the game. Uh, but So this is Cosmic Aftershock and Kings of Urban, two well-known teams in the Rocket League circles, which I'm ashamed to say <laughs> uh, that I know. And uh, uh, it's a 26-minute video. I highly recommend you guys watch it. It's, it's an awesome, awesome, like... A uh, m- couple of matches to watch, and I really recommend you watch all the way to the very end because it's an incredible finish. The game is fantastic, uh, I, and I, it, I just I, I think it's really well suited to, to esports. And it's the first time I've ever sat down and watched esports, and I absolutely loved it. So, just wanted to share it with people. All right, so yours. My end of the sunset. A bit more is, awesome. Well, it's, it's a bit more. It's a bit more uh, dramatic, I suppose. Personal and. The title of this YouTube video that I am linking to is Tears of Joy, My Dad with Oculus Rift, DK2, and Apollo 11 VR. And what you're going to see is a a son put the DK2 Oculus Rift kit on his dad and let him experience the Apollo 11 VR demo. And his dad has always dreamed of being an astronaut. Wanted to be an astronaut when he was a kid, and now he is experiencing the Apollo 11 mission through VR. And, you know, he it has a profound effect on him. He, he cries uh, at, at a couple of points, and he just says, this is the only way I'll ever be able to do this. I always wanted to be an astronaut, and this is the only way it'll ever happen. And you, you get to sort of see... Just how profound and how important 
these experiences are. And, you know, we were just talking about Red Dead, and, and I think, you know, most of the people who have been with us for a long time and listened to that episode of The Axe Factor where we talked about our game of the year being Red Dead, and we related some of the profound emotional things that happened to us in playing that game. And I know that there are people out there that, and I know that there are even gamers out there that aren't particularly, aren't particularly impressed by that, that, you know, that, that think that it's, I don't know, you know, maybe a little silly to get like so wrapped up in something, but if the experience elicits some emotional response from you, if it triggers something in you, if it makes you feel something profound, it has value, I think. And I think that a lot of people look at VR and I think they only see the they only see the gimmick of VR and they don't see the profound emotional experience that could be possible in VR. And this video says everything about that that needs to be said. Yep. This does a much better job of showing the power of VR than, I don't know, say Palmer Lucky jumping up and down on the cover of Time. Yeah, wh- wh- whatever he was doing on the cover of Time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah. A, it's a wonderful video, Brent. I, I hadn't come across it, so thank you for sharing it. I highly recommend everybody should watch this. It's very powerful, yeah, very, very it's, powerful. It's eight minutes long, and it's just, it, it, it's cool. It, it, you're watching somebody experience something that really, really means a lot to them, and it's just one of the it's just the tip of the iceberg of what VR could deliver. So uh go check that out. Indeed. All right. So Brent, next up we have our very first ever on Outlaw Gamer Radio ride along. That's right. That's the listener version of Into the Sunset where you guys get to write on the co- on the post we throw on the front page and we read out every week we'll choose one of those and read out one of yours. And this one is brought to us from listener Erroneous. Uh, and reads as follows. I would like to hear your thoughts on this. At first, so he's referring to an article called Witcher 3 Dev. Free DLC should be the norm, not the exception. This is a GameSpot article about the release of the, quote, 16 pieces of DLC that The Witcher gave out for free. So Erroneous writes, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. At first, I was stoked when we were getting 16 free DLC packs for The Witcher 3, but some of the packs felt like content that should have been part of the game. For example, New Game Plus, or just as a patch, or beard and hairstyle set DLC. Sigh. Or I guess I should have gone, sigh. And to be honest, releasing free DLC over such a long period of time felt like a move to avoid people selling the game and not about giving something back to their customers. He says, now I know CD Projekt Red is very much loved and they have the correct ideas on how to handle DRM or, well, not to handle DRM. But they have failed to deliver proper updates for the PS4, which for months now has been struggling with FPS issues. Personally, I would rather have a proper working game than 15 packs of meaningless DLC. And while new game mode is nice, it doesn't change the fact that the game still has serious issues on PS4. And so obviously, Brent, talking a lot about The Witcher 3, it's a game, a very, very popular game, a game that we love. I do think this is interesting. You know, they've really been touting how they're giving out all this amazing free DLC, uh, 16 pieces of it, Brent. You know, I think they're very quick to throw out that number. And it does beg the question, is it really quality stuff? I don't know. I haven't installed one of them yet. I, I, I think, I mean, I, whatever's auto-downloaded has installed on mine. I have not gone out and got anything. Yeah, I, I will I, agree I that I, I New I Game Plus' is DLC see seems odd. I, Are yeah, you doing my, yours through God but, Galaxy, by the way? No, no, no. I'm playing on... Uh, oh, no, no. Uh, it is uh, Steam. Okay. So I'm assuming it's updating. I don't know. I wouldn't even know. But um, I did think that New Game Plus as a piece of DLC was uh, I, that was odd. That to well, me seems like a not DLC, but like a fe- it's either a feature of the game or it's not. You know, a, like I, I kind of feel like I, I kind of feel like you know we're arguing semantics a little bit here because, uh, like if you just take the DLC thing out of it and say they've they've released 16 updates to the game that. Add things like new game plus mode, a beer and hairstyle set DLC, you know, armor, weapons, and you know that kind of stuff. If you just say they've released 16 updates to the game that add those various kinds of things, is it something worth complaining about? And like, like, well, you know, how, I do how think much Brent- of this is like them calling it DLC and people having different levels of expectation about what DLC entails. 
Well, I'm going to push back on you a little bit on that, only because I think, I, I mean, I agree with you. Certainly, we, we carry our own expectations, and that can sometimes be certainly a, a cause of miscommunication. And, and I, I think if you're right, Brent, if, if they had said, you know, we have all these updates that we want to put in the game, it's all stuff we wanted to get in the game before it went to, to retail, but because of time, we weren't able to, so we're going to go ahead and put it in afterwards. If they had said that, I think people would be like, cool, right on. You wanted to put some extra beards and, and New Game Plus mode, and now you're going to put it in later. Hey, man, thanks so much. But but they're really like making it a big deal of how they give out free DLC, unlike everybody right. else, and how this is this is like we are doing all this amazing free DLC. And I think I don't think that's sort of you carrying your expectations with it. I think they're actively marketing it as if it's they're they're doing something that no other company does, which is which makes them awesomer than everybody else, which is all this free DLC. And and so I do think it deserves scrutiny. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. But Odin knows that other companies have charged for this kind of stuff in the past. So, well, know, but that's neither here nor there. I mean, again, well, no, I, I, th- I do, I do think that if if they're giving away the kinds of content that other people have charged for, then why are they wrong to point that out? Well, it's certainly erroneous. This point is like that's all well and good and fine, but let's start with a game that works first, first and foremost. Well, and like, yeah, yeah, I totally get that. I, I mean, like, you know, the issue, you know, set, setting, you know, setting that issue aside. Uh, you you can kind of have the other discussion, but yeah, I mean, I agree. If if the game doesn't work for you, it, it's meaningless. Uh, and I, I get that, but unfortunately, that's just you know that's the reality of what we deal with. I still haven't fucking played Arkham Knight because the goddamn d- game doesn't work. Yeah, that's a, a true story. I don't give a shit about you know the fucking DLC for that game either. So I totally uh, I totally understand that point of view as well. Um, you know, sometimes you sometimes you get the game on the right system, and sometimes you don't. You got Arkham Knight on PC, you're out of luck, Jack. And certainly, uh, I would uh, I would also call upon CD Projekt Red to get the game supported on PS4. But I yeah. don't. But but I don't fault them for I don't fault them for you know for calling out this DLC. Maybe once I install it and play it, I'll feel differently. Maybe once I start installing it and saying ah, there's you know there's really nothing here. Like this isn't noteworthy. Like these are. These are good updates to the game, but it's it's nothing that they need to be patting themselves on the back for. Maybe I'll feel different once I install a few, but uh, you know, just based on reading the descriptions of what they're giving away and stuff, I don't know. I don't feel like they're, they've done anything wrong. Uh, I'll bet you. I'll bet you money. So you already have these things installed, and you don't even know it. I, you know, I. It's possible. I, 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 I can might. certainly I empathize with the idea that these are. You know, again, I, I think that saying, "Well, at least we're better than the other guys," I, that to me is is a bullshit sort of uh, rationalization for when things are are okay. To me, yeah. uh, to me, quality is measured against uh, a, a measuring stick and not what other people are doing. And I hear that conversation all the time with regards to the, you know America and healthcare and education or whatever and like love it or leave it it's the best thing out there it may be the best thing out there but that doesn't mean it's not shitty and i'm not saying america is shitty i'm just saying um i i don't think the i don't think the fact that these are things that other companies may be charging for makes it right that they're that they're saying oh look we're not charging for a beard color you know what i mean and but but i so i can understand that but i i think it's an interesting uh ride along i appreciate erroneous and just to be clear just to be clear is the is the complaint here that that the 16 pieces of DLC should be better, or is the complaint that C- CD Projekt Red shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be talking about their 16 pieces of DLC? I think. Well, for me, I mean, I you know, I think erroneous. You know, you can sort of read what erroneous read. For me, um, the, the my take on it is, you know, not not that it should be better. Like we deserve 16 pieces of free, awesome content. But I, I do, I do understand if the, the content turned out to be sort of um, less, it, I, I, completely uninteresting in my opinion. And I, I think they're they sort of oversold the graciousness which with they are, which with they are, uh, you know, their benevolence is being uh, shined upon us with with this amazing amount of DLC. That's just just my opinion. And erroneous, uh, you know, obviously brings up a couple of different things. Just saying, look, they're a little disappointing. And the game doesn't even work, and so right, uh, you know. But that's my my take on it. Is you know. All right. Well, I'll I'll uh, I'll hold off on opining further until I've actually experienced one of these pieces of DLC. Because at this point, I, I don't know if I've really formed much of an opinion uh, beyond just one way or the what other. I've read sure. about it. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right. No, Erroneous, thank you for being the first ever ride along yeah, on Outlaw one. Gamer Radio. It was a great one. And with that, Brent, I think we will call it a show. As usual, we want to hear your thoughts on everything we talked about this week, whether it's The Witcher 3 or Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, Fallout Shelter, or Rocket League. Of course, we want to hear your comments about Brent's awesome video about my dad with the Oculus Rift. Well, not my dad, but that guy's dad with Oculus Rift DK2. What we talked about up in the clubhouse, returning to World War II genre games and what we might do to make them better. Mad Max, Uncharted, the Nathan Drake Collection, Until Dawn, and the delay of Rainbow Six Siege. We want to hear your thoughts on those and all other topics and gaming. And to that end, if you want to ride along with us next week, make sure you head over to the front page of the Outlaw Gamer Society website. At the top, there's a post there about the ride-along. Post your comments in that section, and we will pick one for next week. We'd love to include you guys in the show. As usual, he is Brent Adams, and I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing.